let when the user chooses either um, meal or budget, Kabam either returns the top three or the cheapest ingredient. With the ingredient, Kabam then searches for recipes on Adama and scores each recipe using what I like to call the nutrition score pyramid, which is based on the recommended daily intake for each nutrient. If there's no recommended daily intake, or if that value ex exceeds 100, then the nutrient gets a negative score. Whereas for the remaining nu uh, nutrient, um, the score increases incrementally depending on the value. Then there, uh, it returns a list of recipes with a nutrition score, and only the top three healthiest options are returned for the user to choose from. Then you pick what you like to cook, uh, and a list of ingredients is parsed using um, natural language processing, uh, where you get a list that looks like this. And given the serving size, Kabam then use it to calculate a grocery uh, list um, for the fresh produce that's used for that um, recipe, as well as providing a link to that recipe. And this is Kabam. You can balance your diet and budget in just one place. Thank you. Thanks, Vanessa. Does anyone have any questions? Hi, Vanessa. Could uh, This is Cliff from Oxus. And uh, I was just wondering, could you give us a little more information about, you know, how you used NLP to, you know, capture the, um, the correct ingredients? Mm -hmm. So uh, with uh, usually on um, in a recipe, you will see ingredients lines like two cups of um, like I sorry one one broccoli, uh, two cups of vegetable broth, um, and like maybe one clove of garlic. So using NLP, it now separates um, the amount, which gives you like two, and then the unit, which for garlic in that case will be clove, and then find the nutrient that says um, garlic. So that's how uh, NLP separates, um, you know, amount, quantity, uh, sorry, a quantity unit, as well as the item. And if there's like any additional notes that the uh, recipe provider added, for example, like chop into small pieces, then that goes into a separate bracket um, that's like additional notes. So we're using these categories, I pick only the item in that sense, and then I use it to search for the fresh produce from the list pulled from the store location. Thank you. And, uh, you know, the uh, as far as the actual code for the NLP, uh, was that based on, you know, just uh, available uh, different types of source codes from, say, like GitHub, you know, for this type of NLP application? Or uh, mm -hmm. was there any other tools, you know, that you used to, uh, to kind of craft the NLP code? So uh, right now I'm using a using a existing um, NLP source code uh, called an ingredient parser. So I've also been like trying to train an additional model that actually separates, for example, branded food items, like I don't know Kroger minced meat. So like I wanted to recognize that Kroger is a brand. Um, so I think like there are multiple ways to approach it, but like this is one of the streams that I've look, been looking into. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you for the question. Any other questions for Vanessa? Yeah, this is Hunter Moore from Rotunda Solutions. Um, I, I had a question. Do you have any way that of looking into it where, uh, you know, I might be able to put like a couple of different recipes or, or maybe like some ideas for putting a couple of different recipes together and then finding some way of optimizing, uh, you know, the, the grocery list or, or whatnot based on that and maybe provide suggestions like, hey, now that you've done these, you're going to be purchasing in this quantity and therefore this is some suggested recipes to finish up the food. Oh, that, that is a great idea. Thank you, Hunter. Um, I This is definitely in the pipeline because it happens to me also that from time to time, like you get more um, ingredients than needed because you simply can't buy less and it's like a fixed unit. So um, definitely it's in the pipeline to um, optimize this. And I think one way to do it is, um, it also depends on the serving size that you're preparing for each item. And I think 
um, it will be like the next steps would be also asking users like, you know, is it like regular for you to prepare this much food? And using that to search for other recipes that uses that utilizes the remaining uh, amount of food, um, because I when I uh, pull the when I calculate the score for the recipes, I already have all the necessary information uh, to do that. So the next step is just to implement from the user, like you know, if this is the amount you'd like to make, I will search then um, for recipes that uses exactly that much or roughly that much amount of ingredients and then just uh, match it or like, you know, as a suggestion, like, hey, if you have leftovers, you can also try this recipe. Okay, great. I hope that, answer, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, that answered it. And then one last question, if, if I have a second, if I don't, I understand, I can ask later, but uh, how did you calculate the score, the nutrition score? Like, what's it out of? So I used um, nutrition score Sorry, can Vanessa, I you accidentally muted yourself. Oh, sorry, thank you. Oh yeah, I used the um, nutrition score pyramid that is um, based on the recommended daily intake of each nutrient. So uh, from each recipe, it also contains a nutrition label where all these information is um, provided. Then I uh, normalize it to just one serving. And based on that value, I then calculate the score um, for like for example, like saturated fats, it does not have a recommended daily intake, then it would not automatically get a negative score. And if it's like carbohydrates or like protein, uh, for these, uh, if it's like within like regular, like normal range, that's not exceeding 100%, then it will also get like a score uh, depending on the amount that it's available in the recipe. Awesome, thank you. Perfect, thank you. Thank you for the question. Great, thank you so much, Vanessa. So moving to our second presenter, Merded Z Zamirian and his capstone project entitled Detecting Drowsy Drivers Using Deep Learning. Merded is one of our data science students and he has earned his PhD in petroleum engineering from WVU. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, do you hear me well and do you see my desk? Okay. We do. Uh, awesome. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, detecting drowsy drivers using uh, deep learning. Uh, according to National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, every year there are around 100,000 drowsy driving related accidents in the United States that would result in around 800 fatalities, 50,000 injuries, and it would cost more than $100 billion uh, to the society. So I was thinking, what if we can uh, monitor the driver constantly, and in case if their eyes are closed and if they are uh, basically drowsy, uh, issue a warning and basically wakes, uh, wake them up. So the objective of this project came to uh, detecting if the driver's eye are uh, open or closed through a video feed, live video feed, and then alarming the driver in case the eyes are closed for a specific period of time or longer. So to do this project, there were a couple of steps that they were taking. First, uh, I gathered uh, data, which was uh, including 48,000 images of just eyes, which they were classified uh, in a balanced way into closed and open eyes. Then I augmented data based on uh, flipping the uh, images, rotating them, and also uh, playing around with the uh, reflection and the brightness of the images. Then I trained a convolutional neural network model to detect two uh, classifications of closed and open eyes. And on top of that, I used two pre-trained models known as Har cascade to detect first the human face and then uh, the human eyes. Finally, I'm com uh, I combined all of these three models together, put them through a Flask app, and this way, it would receive a video feed and process the uh, images. So the workflow would work in this way that the first model would receive the images and basically it detects the human face and creates a bounding box through the human face. The second model goes inside the human face bounding box and finds the eyes and creates a bounding box around the eyes. And then the second model would be 
send to the third model, which is the convolutional neural network, and detects the state of the eye that either the eyes are closed uh, or open. And all of these models are combined together and sent through a flask, and it processes the live uh, video feed. So what I'm going to show you over here is the final product that I recorded myself, and I just moved at different locations of the frame. I opened my eyes and closed them to just see how uh, the model would detect the eyes are closed or open. And if they are closed more than here, uh, by the default, more than 10 uh, image frames, it would issue a warning to wake up and it automatically resets itself when the eyes are open. This uh, project is already available on uh, GitHub and actually anyone can have access to that. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. I would be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, so, Merdad, this is uh, Cliff Emmons from Oxus. Uh, first of all, I just want to congratulate you on a, on a really excellent presentation. I, I, I love the way that you you uh, went through everything and kind of broke broke things down, the workflow, et cetera. Um, I, I am kind of curious, uh, what, uh, what kind of research did you do relative to uh, landing on that the Har cascade, you know, pre-trained -trained models were uh, the ones that you wanted to to use in this particular application. Um, originally, uh, I wanted to uh, do this by myself, and uh, I realized if I want to do it by myself, I need a lot of data, and there are already pre-trained models ready that uh, are very reliable, and we can uh, use them. So I looked around and I chose Har Cascade because of uh, one major reason. Har Cascade works based on the uh, boosting techniques and actually it can process the data very, very fast. And this is one of the main reasons I picked Har Cascade because it can be implemented uh, even on the cell phones and it has a very high uh, processing speed. Excellent. Excellent. And uh, I, that was very impressive when you were kind of showing somewhat the, you know, live, live feed of, of the Apple. Uh, Thank you. The second question has to sure. do with, I'm very curious when you said that you were able to combine all of the three models together, you know, using the Flask application. Can, can you give us some more background about, you know, exactly what is going on when, when you, uh, utilize uh, okay, the Flask sure. app and and how it's combining those those uh, models. Uh, sure. Uh, every video feed is consistent of uh, video frames. So basically, they are just images that are rendered sequentially, but the uh, basically frame rate uh, per second is 20 milliseconds. So every 20 milliseconds by the default by these videos, I will receive an image. And when you put them all together, basically, you will see the video. So the way that it works is that uh, for every uh, video frame or every 20 milliseconds, the image would be sent to the first hard cascade model and it detects the human face. Then this human face would be sent to the second hard cascade that goes through the human face and identifies the eyes. After these eyes were identified, these eyes would be sent to the third model, which is the CNN model that I trained it myself. And it detects if the eyes are closed or open. All of them are put together in the uh, Flask app. And this process would happen continuously every 20 uh, milliseconds. Excellent, excellent. So, um, and and it is the, all, all the computations are, are completed with within just that one frame time, that 20 millisecond time. Is yes. that correct? Okay. Yes. In every 20 milliseconds, all of these uh, three decisions are already made. Yes. That is good. Yeah. Uh, I guess I guess the final question would be um, so how would you like to see this applied? Because I, I do know that in say like right now in Subaru's, um, you know, I, I have a friend who has one that actually already has you know, a, a program, you know, where, you know, a, an alarm goes off if it feels that it's detecting a drowsy, uh, you know, a drowsy condition in the driver. 
uh, I'm not sure I that, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering what what your goal is with how are you hoping this this will be used by people that uh, you're, you're, sure yeah. uh, when I was talking about it, actually I was uh, doing the research uh, I noticed that there are uh, two groups of uh, people that are significantly uh, susceptible to uh, drowsy driving uh, one are the, in the uh, range, uh, age range of uh, 16 to 24, the, let's call it teenagers. And the other ones are in the age range of 35 to 45, which usually are the uh, working people. And uh, I was thinking uh, one of the major issues would be, let's say, uh, truck drivers, because they are driving constantly every day. And this is a very exhausting job. And Right now, there are many uh, car companies that are using image processing, like let's say Tesla, that they are uh, using camera and uh, do image processing and image uh, recognition outside of the car. And actually it is more complicated than just watching the face of a driver that is a constant human face and uh, detect either they are open or closed. So I think it would be uh, very doable and it would help uh, a lot of people and reduce uh, the casualties and the costs that uh, burdens the society. Because uh, this uh, data that I provided, many researchers also said the real uh, data is up to three times than what I reported here. And uh, this data is very uh, basically under exaggerated the situation. Thanks very much. Any other questions for Merdad? Okay, in the interest of time, we will move on to our third presenter, uh, Stephen Rowe. Stephen will be presenting his project Ovino, a price recommendation app for wine. Stephen is in our data science cohort and he has a PhD in astrophysics from the University of Toronto. Take it away, Stephen. Hey, thanks, Sarah. I'm just uh, requesting access. Okay, I think I have it. Okay, good. Let me know if you can hear me and see the video or my screen. Good. Okay, great. Thank you. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Steven, and I'm excited to show you my app called Ovino. Ovino is motivated by my desire to try and explore wine. I'm a Canadian from Toronto, Ontario, and I can see a live inventory of absolutely all alcohol throughout our entire province on one website. And this is because all alcohol sales are completely managed by our government. Unfortunately, oops, unfortunately, no one uses their website. For instance, this wine bottle has zero ratings and zero reviews. And it's not helpful. But on a popular wine app called Vivino, the same bottle of wine has over 200,000 reviews. And this app has a lot of information. But a setback is that I have to manually search for each bottle of wine just to check their ratings. And it's just too much work. So this is where Ovino comes in. Let me just pull up my website. So here's Ovino, and it works on mobile too. And all you do is you enter your location. So I live close to High Park, Toronto. And it will pull up the, the nearest liquor store. So here it is. It's at Bloor and Runnymede. It'll show you uh, its location relative to you. And uh, as I scroll down, there's a list of recommended bottles available at this store. And so you can see you know, the product information, the price, uh, the picture, all these descriptions. And then you can see that the star rating is scraped from Vivino. And as I scroll down, you can find a, a list of recommendations. And you might notice that they're not ordered by price and they're not ordered by star rating. Instead, they're ordered by what I've called the price sentiment, uh, and that's listed here. And so what is price sentiment and why is it valuable? Okay. Okay, so when I looked at the reviews on Vivino very carefully, I noticed about 1% of them contained the price that people paid and the sentiment for that price. So you can see here, $25, nope, and then very nice for $15. This is valuable because, well, our government has a complete monopoly on the alcohol market, and we, the people of Ontario, believe there is price gouging going on. And it makes me feel discouraged from exploring and trying wine because generally I'm afraid of being ripped off from our government. And so knowing what other people have paid is valuable to me. And so what I've done is I've scraped all the reviews from Vivino um, and assigned positive and negative sentiments to about 2000 samples to build my training set. I then use NLP to remove irrelevant uh, wine terminologies 
in the review, like Sauvignon, vanilla, minerality. Uh, and once those are removed, they get uh, passed into uh, my machine learning model. And then I, once I have my uh, training model, I apply them to the remaining wine reviews to automatically determine the price sentiment. And then I host all these results on Postgres database and present the app using Flask. Okay, so what does all that mean? So the result is, is that for a given bottle like this one, the positive sentiments that I care about are those who paid more than me and thought it was worth it. And so in this case, there are 44 of them. The negative sentiments are those who paid less than me and thought it was not worth it. And so here I have one user. And the fraction of positive sentiments is the positivity score. And that's how I've been ranking uh, each bottle of wine on Ovino. Okay, so what's the verdict? Well, Don, one of our instructors, suggested that I should try eating my own dog food. So I did. Uh, I blindly picked the first two bottles that seemed interesting to me from my app, a Malbec and a Sauvignon White. And I'm delighted to report that my girlfriend and I genuinely love these bottles. It was also unexpectedly fun looking for wine with my app uh, on my phone, and it felt like a treasure hunt. Um, so thank you for listening and learning about Uvino, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, so this is uh, Cliff from Oxus. Just want to do a shout out. I was teasing you last night with my glass of wine. As yeah, I uh, do, you have yours today? Uh, no, no, I'm gonna just uh, <laughs> diet Dr Pepper tonight. Oh, uh, that's uh, okay. Maybe later. I gotta, I gotta drive a little later tonight. So oh, okay, okay. Well, that's good. <laughs> so, um, I, I am kind of curious. Uh, First of all, I think uh, Canadians, uh, wine lovers in Canada, uh, Canada are going to be over over the top with your uh, with your application. But it, it is curious because it seems to be very oriented toward that particular uh, challenge that you have, you know, because of the government control. Um, right. Have you know? Um, uh, just wondering if you you have any thoughts about how uh, you know people. It it seems like it would still be applicable to people in the US because, you know, distributor ch challenges, differences. And uh, just wondering if you've been able to, you know, quote, sample it to an American. Uh, yeah, so so uh, I, I've looked in the US and there are some states that have, um, I don't know if I use the same- New Hampshire, I think is a good that's, example. That's, that's right. And and uh, and I think I checked a couple of them. I don't remember the, the state names. I think it was like Idaho. But uh, they do also list the inventory live uh, of their mm -hmm. bottles. Um, so, so there's potential there. Uh, and there's also just businesses that, that, that look like the LCBO website, right? So uh, my partner is in California and she said she goes to BevMo and it's just the same thing. You know, it says the bottles are here and here's what we have and here's the price and it's on sale. So the main challenge there would be um, interfacing with that data. So a lot of places don't have APIs. So it'd be a bit of web scraping. Um, but I've been kind of digging around because there's a lot of people who, who are making these automatic, you know, AI informed web scrapers. I, I don't know how they work, but but uh, they're doing all the heavy lifting. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a that's a natural expansion for this. Uh, OK. And and uh, I was really curious. You, you said, you know, you use NLP plus machine learning. Can you tell us what techniques in machine learning did you right. use to actually create the price sentiment? Yeah. Yep. So, so uh, the NLP part would be taking the reviews, and uh, there's actually two parts. So one is identifying uh, the the kind of key words of wine, right? So I said minerality and Sauvignon, and then uh, once I have that, I treat them as stock words, and I and I, and I pull them out of the review because they're not helpful. Uh, they're not informative for the price sentiment. And so once I have the sort of stripped review, uh, and my uh, my collection of of uh, uh, sentiments that I, I assign to them. I then pass it on to two steps in the pipeline. One is a TFID effectorizer, and I did uh, uh, monograms and bigrams. I found that if I went above bigrams, like trigrams and more, there was just no improvement. And uh, once I have that, I pass it on to uh, SVM, an SGD classifier, and I did a bit of grid search to find the optimal hyperparameter. Excellent, excellent. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. You're welcome, Cliff. Any other questions for Steven? Um, oh, you, go ahead. If you created your own 
um, data set to train this data, was that necessary or could you have done that in another way? Yeah, so so, so there are actually two ways to, to you know, measure sentiment. Uh, one way is the way I described, and then the other way is um, you would say one star ratings are negative sentiment and five star ratings are positive sentiment. And so I actually did that way just to see what I would get. Um, and, and so I have a lot more reviews. It doesn't require any too much effort. And um, what, you, what you'll find, oh, so, so here's the trick. So I, once I trained the model and it seemed to be doing something, uh, I, I realized that while I was uh, also looking at the reviews um, at the same time, I noticed that the reviews are, are most of them are homogeneous. Like the sentiments per, for each sentence are generally go one way or the other, right? The, it's all positive or it's all negative. But there are reviews where people will say, you know, one star, trash wine, but good for five bucks, right? And then you'll get the other end, which is like great wine, amazing, you know, but don't pay more than 50, right? And so so, so the, the reviews are inhomogeneous in sentiment. And then, uh, so once I had my star rating model, I was just gonna do 500, you know, reviews and sentimize them, that'll just take like an hour. But when I was explaining to my partner, like the, the, what I was doing, she really wanted to join in and she's like, I can do surveys, you know, <laughs> I can fill it out. And then she uh, exploded the number of samples I had to 2,000. And then when I when I ran the you know the 2,000 sample model, it, it performs a lot better um, by about 10 percent. Um, so that was a relief uh, and nice to see. Cool. Thanks for your question, Emily. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Stephen. You're welcome. Um, Moving on to our next presenter, uh, our next presenter is Christian and Malaya, and his project is called Epicure's Compass. Uh, Christian and is one of our data science students, and he has his PhD in physics uh, from Penn State. Hi, um, let me share my screen, and I hope you can uh, see my screen and hear me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so let me introduce you to Epicure's Compass, um, and this will help you guide through your journey uh, in exploring cuisines. And for now, I'm going to uh, focus on Indian cuisine. And there are at least 39 cuisines, and that's an overwhelmingly large number of diverse cuisines. And definitely you will encounter this situation where you are confused on what you want to order. So that's where my app comes in. And let's see how it works. So here you have, um, you can enter what's your favorite dish that you generally order and that you that you can call it your comfort food. Uh, let me put fried rice in my case. And you can select a few options on what, what fried rice is your favorite food. Um, let me go with uh, chicken fried rice. And here is the destination that I'm going to take India for now. And let me go south of India. So that's the southern part of India. So I'm going to explore the cuisines in the southern part of India and see what is the cuisine that it would recommend given that I like fried rice. So it will find out the, um, it will, the compass points to two items right now. So this is um, something that's not exactly fried rice. Uh, it has rice, it has uh, some elements of fried rice in it, um, but it doesn't have chicken and it doesn't look exactly like fried rice that we have. Um, the other option has chicken, and again, that's uh, that has a it's a rice based item, uh, but not fried rice. And the reason is that fried rice is not an authentic South Indian food. Um, now let me go to eastern part of India. Now here, um, eastern part is much more influenced by Chinese and Mongolian cuisines, and there you see you get exactly something fried rice, and you can also see that it is a fusion of Indian and Chinese cuisines. This might be too close to what you like and maybe you want you feel more adventurous you wanted to try somewhat similar not exact fried rice but something similar uh, and in that case it suggests yeah something slightly different it's mushroom fried rice instead of chicken fried rice maybe that's also too close for me i want to be surprised and look at look at something really different um yeah in that case yeah it suggests something else like chicken momos it's like chicken dumplings that's uh, different and interesting and this also looks interesting to me so how does it work? Um, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, what's going on under the hood? So you enter your inputs and based on your cuisine and your favorite food, it scrapes the recipe from uh, two websites. And here I have um, the database created from 7,000 recipes of Indian cuisines. 
Um, and from these recipes, uh, it will extract and uh, process the ingredients. And from these ingredients, um, I use natural language processing to find similarity between various ingredients. And for this, I use a um, neural network model called Word2Ec. And I trained this Word2Ec on a um, data that had 2 million recipes, which I got from this website. And with this Word2Ec model that I trained, uh, I get similarity between ingredients. Now, depending on my comfort zone, I can set a cutoff for the similarity um, and uh, the, the surprise me will have the lowest, lowest cutoff. And based on this cutoff, I count the ingredients that have a similarity above the cutoff. And based on this, I, uh, I can return, this app will return the most similar food item. So that's it. So that's pretty simple. And this app can definitely be improved into uh, future directions like uh, adding dietary restrictions or expanding the database for more cuisines or improving the overall quality of predictions. And so I hope I made you hungry and um, try this out. And I, I'm happy to answer questions. Hi, this is Cliff from Oxus, and uh, thanks for this. Uh, I, I I know uh, I'm going to have to share share this with my wife because she loves Indian mm -hmm. food. Uh, but um, a question, uh, really curious, with with the cuisine uh, being so large, you know, especially mm -hmm. over the expanse of India, um, I was curious how you chose wound up choosing the database you did as kind of like your source. Uh, source mm. base for this. Yeah, so um, the the website that I chose um, was a, um, was specific to Indian cuisines, and it had a rough category of uh, where the cuisine came from, um, or the which part of uh, cuisine that it belonged to. Um, and from that category, I could broadly divide it into north, south, east, and west. Um, and within that, um, if I had a more refined database, uh, and that would indeed be a, a more interesting problem, which is to fine tune the cuisines to figure out exactly which part of India it came from. Uh, but right now, that kind of a fine tuned distinction is not there. So I, depending on broadly where the recipe came from, I divided it into north, south, east, and west. And so that, that's how I created a database of four cuisines from this, uh, from all the recipes in this website. So. Um, yeah. Excellent. So uh, I'm also curious to understand, um, for, first of all, um, like to understand a little bit more about cosine similarity and why mm. you chose, uh, you know, word to vec uh, mm. as, as your primary similarity uh, test. Yeah. So let me first uh, answer the second question of why I chose word to vec um, because uh, I realized that um, uh, by going through a few cuisines, I realized that um, a lot of the ingredients are um, have a lot of different names. Uh, they're the same ingredients, but they're known by different names in India. For example, a simple one would be yogurt. It's called curd in India. Uh, but mm -hmm. even within mm -hmm. curd, different parts of India call it in slightly different ways. And although it's written in English, it's, it means the same thing, but it reads differently. So I needed some model that can find synonyms of words, uh, not exact words uh. as such. And that's what brought me to word 2 and, and the nice thing about word 2 is that it can uh, embed the ingredient into a vector in a high dimensional space. And, um, and similar, uh, similar appearing words have a similar direction in this vector. So by taking cosine similarity, uh, it tells you which, word, which ingredients are kind of synonyms of each other. And that way, um, even if the exact ingredient does not show up, it can find the synonymous ingredient and give you um, the recommendation. So the cosine similarity finds out how similar, how synonymous words are. And the cutoff tells you um, how much you can trust that similarity. So that that's that that's roughly the okay. excellent, fascinating. I never thought vectors would ever have anything to do with uh, food. So pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to one ask one mm -hmm. question if we have time. Uh, yeah. In your similarity score, do you, uh, do you give some sort of weights to salt and sugar or other spices? Because yeah, so, uh, the ingredients could be very similar, but have different taste depending on how you make it. Yeah, uh, exactly. What kind of so, spices you add? Yeah, so thank you for that question. Because, uh, so another thing I realized about Indian cuisines is that um, they, they, they use a lot of spices. 
Um, and so it, it and I realized that uh, most of the ingredients can be divided into two groups, um, like uh, the ingredients that appear in bulk. They I call them as cup ingredients, and the ingredients that you use in spoonful quantities, like teaspoons. So. Um, uh, so um, I, I've divided the based on the amount of uh, quantity or amount of ingredient present. I divided them into cups and teaspoons, and I have assigned a slightly slower weight to teaspoon compared to cup because I really, because one teaspoon is uh, one by sixteenth of a cup. So I I put one by four as a weight, which is just a, a hand picked weight. Uh, but the reason for doing that was uh, to distinguish um, cup and teaspoon. And I wanted to give more weight to cup than to teaspoon, because even if a few spices are slightly different, uh, that shouldn't stop stop the uh, similarity from finding similar food. Um, so yeah, so that that's what this step does, like dividing it to cup and spoon. So, and if, if it is salt, um, usually they say a pinch of salt and pinch is also a keyword that goes into teaspoon. So. Uh, and if it says handful of sugar, I would put sugar in the cup quantity. So that that's how I did the splitting between a rough way of getting the amount of measurement used in the ingredients. Uh, okay, I hope that thank you. Yeah. I was actually looking for different, uh, thinking about different scenario. For example, you can make banana dish in two ways. One can be sweet and one can be savory. And mm. uh, I was wondering if you would pick that up. And in that case, I was thinking maybe you would have more weightage on teaspoon because even though spices uh, are in smaller quantity, it can make a like bigger yeah, difference uh, in terms of taste. Yeah, maybe I should put a. I think that's a good uh, suggestion. Like I can put a, a tuning knob for tuning how spicy you want, um, and that could change the weight of teaspoon versus cup. And I, I think that that could be a added improvement. Uh, um, in fine tuning how spicy or how uh, um, fine tuned your uh, matching has to be so maybe maybe putting a uh, tuning for the weight would help in that case thank you for that suggestion any last questions for krishna okay then i think we are ready to move on to our final presenter um our final presenter is Mark Palaus, and his project is called GameGuard, an ML solution to protect gamers from microtransaction addiction. Mark is one of our data science students, and he has his PhD in cognitive neuroscience at the Open University of Catalonia. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, my name is Mark Palaus, and I'm here to present GameGuard, a machine learning solution to protect gamers from microtransaction addiction. So while many studies have demonstrated some cognitive benefits of playing video games, there are also some potentially negative consequences, the main one being the risk of addiction. Recently, many video game developers have been introducing microtransactions in their games, which are small purchases that provide additional content or features to the game. Uh, however, there is one kind of microtransaction in particular, what we call loot boxes, where the item the player obtains, it's completely random, and that includes its value. So it's not very different from a lottery. This has raised concerns about the potential for addiction and excessive spending, especially for younger players. Some governments are trying to regulate these loot boxes to various degrees of success. My project will go a step further by developing a real-time monitoring system that will prevent microtransaction addiction by tracking and mitigating addictive behavior. The aim here is to help prevent government agencies, uh, to help government agencies supervise those purchases and prevent video game addiction. Some companies actually publish open data about loot box purchases. In my case, I've used loot box purchase data for the game Counter-Strike in the Chinese market, which is available in the form of an online JSON stream. That JSON stream is updated every 10 minutes and contains a timestamp, the user that made the purchase, the loot box itself, and the outcome of the outcome of the loot box. I've developed a Python ingestion script that is gathering data, and I already have information on more than 1.7 million purchases. So when you open a loot box, the outcome has no intrinsic value. It's just meant to be used inside the game. So the data I'm collecting uh, does not include any sort of price for each loot box. However, there are online markets where people buy and sell these rewards. So by scraping the website of one of these markets, I was able to assign a price in US dollars to each purchase in my data set. There's one more thing though. If we want to know which users in our loot box data set are in risk of addiction, 
we need to compare their purchase patterns with those of people with actual addiction. I've used a label data set from a 2012 study on, on online gambling that compared users with gambling problems against controls. The raw data in the gambling data set is very similar to the loot box data set, so the same features could be uh, replicated in both. Then, after having trained a machine learning classifier on the labeled gambling data set, I applied that model to the unlabeled loot box data set to get my predictions. And I found out that around 0.22% of all users were showing some symptoms of addiction. I have successfully developed an online dashboard that is capable of displaying loot box purchase patterns in real time. It provides a risk score for each user, and you can visualize user metrics like the evolution of the risk score through time and the loot box purchase history, and even inspect the raw data. With implementation of this tool, regulatory agencies can effectively supervise users and take necessary actions. That includes establishing cooldown periods and limiting microtransactions in order to help prevent addiction. The end goal of GameGuard is not only to create an efficient model that recognizes symptoms of addiction, but to provide a solution where companies can take into account the mental health issues linked to their products. With this approach, we can address the problematic aspects associated with video games, which reflect negatively on the game developer industry. Thank you very much. Hey, Mark. Carl from Peregrine Advisors here. Could you go into some more detail about the specific features uh, that really indicate uh, you know, addiction potential and kind of their impact on how well they allow you to be able to classify? OK, so yeah. Uh... The original features, I use the same that were used in the 2012 study. It was from a group of studies in the, called the Transparency Project, carried out by the Cambridge Health Alliance. And basically, uh, they compared a group of uh, 4,000 users. 2,000 of them were showing some kinds of addiction, and the rest were controls. And basically, uh, they, they made daily aggregates of their purchase history. And then with that, they created like an analytic data set with nine key features. And those features were mostly related to the number of bets placed per day, the amount of money spent per day, the amount of revenue they made during the day, the number of consecutive days they played, uh, uh, well, they, they betted actually in the online casino, or the proportion of days uh, since they started that they played on the online casino. So um, instead of bets in the loot box purchase pattern data set, I use uh, actual loot box purchases. So one loot box purchase is one bet. And I try I replicate it. I, I, I'm sorry. I created the same daily aggregate and replicated the same nine features. Did you take a closer look at any of the particular users? Was, was there any potential for someone to be misclassified as addicted if they were continuing to open loot boxes until they got a specific item and then they stopped or anything like that? Uh, yeah, the thing is, uh, the purchase patterns of loot boxes and bets on online casinos are very different because when you play on an online casino, you expect to make some money. But when you open a purchase, uh, a loot box, sorry, uh, you expect just to get an item and most people like it, they just use it inside the game. So it's very different. And uh, so, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't think that they could be comparable, but. So, sorry, I, could you go again with the question? I, I forgot the first the second thing you asked. It, it was um, whether you had taken a, a deep dive into any of these oh, yeah. particular users to actually validate that yes, uh, perception. Is. So uh, in the games of lookbox purchases, I found that some users, like uh, they didn't appear for a lot of days, but just someday they appeared. They bought like maybe 100, 200, 300 loot boxes, and they, they never came again. And I don't think this could be classified as risk of addiction because uh, for risk of addiction, there needs to be like some constant, a constant pattern of purchases. So I think uh, this tool uh, could also be useful to detect other kind of patterns. And I'm suspecting uh, due to the history of lot boxes and some companies already reported it, uh, there could be a, you know, a history of a credit card fraud involved as well. So maybe the model could be trained to detect those things too. All right. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Uh, so, Mark, uh, this is Cliff from Oxus. I'm, I'm just trying to. Um, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, it, it just seemed 
uh, it seemed like the 0.22 percent, uh, you know, prevalence or potential prevalence of potential addiction there mm-hmm. seemed seemed a little low to me. So, but um, I really don't have a context. Can you share, like, when you looked at the study for, say, online gambling, you know, of the, you know, online gamblers, what what type of prevalence was there, uh, you know, in in comparison was was it a higher percentage, a lower percentage than this 0.22% that you, uh, that you. Mm-hmm. Uh, All right. So the gambling study, actually, uh, they only work with people with addiction and then they match those uh, addict uh, users with controls. So you had a, a very balanced, every user was balanced with a non, uh, a non addict match. So in that okay. case, you had so there like was, two- but there was no, uh, there was no baseline baseline for prevalence of of you know of the percentage of online gamblers how many of them you know are are oh, i would need know, to uh, look at the study again i think yeah. there was but i don't have the exact numbers right now i don't know them by heart so, I'm sorry so the but, second question is i you know i think it, it's a very useful and interesting standpoint i'm just curious about um you know, how do you think that this can be applied to actually help this situation? It it seems like it's it's you know it it's great as a predictor of again what the prevalence may be, but again mm-hmm. in relative terms, you know, as bad as or, or worse than than what we expect, unless you have comparisons, it's kind of tough to tell. But the other thing is 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 like it seems as if the people you know that you use the data to gather and, and do this type of uh, prediction are probably the least people interested in worrying about this type of situation. And in fact, I would be even worried that they would try and concentrate and profile and even, you know, uh, try to target advertisements for the 0.22%. So I'm just kind of curious, how would you like to see, you know, this used to actually help people that are potentially becoming addicted? So that's a very interesting question. So actually, that, that was the initial idea. That should be a dashboard that this, the game company itself could use to you know, detect when a user is getting addicted. But uh, I believe that this could be a conflict of interest because you know uh, between the desire of maximize profits and the need to protect users from addiction. So you know uh, the same company shouldn't... Maybe it's not the most appropriate thing. So uh, here's why I, I incorporated the presence of regulatory agencies. So while the the dashboard is intended to be used for the game studio itself, uh, there has to uh, super there has there needs to be some supervision from a regulatory agency. Maybe not access to all the data, but maybe in the form of periodical reports or some other kind of uh, data access where they could follow that the company is actually following the regulations uh, applicable to a specific country or specific state in the U.S. Or, or potential, you know, regulations as far as mm-hmm. reporting, reporting exactly. using, you know, uh, self-testing and self-reporting mm-hmm. of, of this. Thanks very much. Very interesting. Thanks. Any last questions for Mark? Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much to all of our presenters. I'm sure you guys can tell how much work that they put into these um, and how much time and and effort (laughs) it really takes to to put these projects together in seven weeks. Um, Now that we've concluded our capstone presentations, we are going to move into breakout rooms. Um, In the breakout rooms, you'll have